Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. I see we have a number of questions that got left over uh, from a previous time. And um, there's a question from Turkey here asking, so, so one of the things that uh, uh, is asking about recording different kinds of things about one's life. Um, you know, one of the things that I have done for many years, more than 30 years now, is sort of record data about myself and what I'm doing. And honestly, if it took me a lot of effort to do it, I wouldn't do it. But I've set up systems that, you know, record every keystroke I type, they take s screenshots of my computer, you know, I've recorded all the emails, all text messages, all these, all these different kinds of things. Um, recorded lots and lots of things. Um, and uh, uh, occasionally, I'll go and look at these things. Um, and for some things like emails, it's, you know, really worthwhile to be able to search them. And that's kind of how I, um, how I augment my memory of things. Um, for other things, it's more like, let's analyze this, let's find out. I mean, for, for instance, I, I found out things about myself, because I measured my, you know, continuous heart rate for quite a few years, things like that. And I can measure Oh, you know, when uh, I, I discovered, for example, that when I walk outside instead of uh, uh, walking like on a treadmill or something to get my exercise every day, that uh, makes my heart rate go down. So I don't know why, but but um, it's just an observation. Um, and uh, uh, then um, things like when I when I finish a big project. Um, when I'm in, in this late months of finishing a big project, I usually end up, uh, uh, maybe my metabolism goes up and I weigh less and things like this. So there are all kinds of weird things I discover about myself. Um, the, uh, um, so uh, the question was what, what I record and um, uh, things like what I know about things I've, I've, I've said and so on. You know, I, I have recorded, as I said, I've got about 3 million emails that I've recorded over the last 30 years. Um, and uh, I've been meaning to do some analyses, like when did I first mention this or that word? When did I first mention the word blog? Because, you know, languages evolve. So there are words that, like the word blog, came into existence in English at some point, um, and it just didn't exist before then. And there are other words that I probably started using at some time. I think I did this analysis for names of functions in our Wolfram language, which got invented at some point. They just didn't exist as words before that. They got invented and then I start mentioning them. And so it's sort of a question for me personally, uh, looking at the evolution of language. I mean, we know when we look at something like English, the English as used by Shakespeare is different from the English that we use a few hundred years later. Um, and there's sort of the question of how, how what, is the, what is the evolution of language? How, what does it look like? And for me personally, over the course of 30 years, what does the evolution of my language look like, so to speak? Um, and uh, so the question of what, um, um, uh, you know, there, there are some principles about how language evolves. Like one of the principles I always, I always find fun is, uh, you know, when I write things and so on and, and um, uh, people proofread them and they'll say that word is spelled wrong about some word. Well, the one thing that is, is uh, and let's say it's a two word thing. Let's say it's a, a word like website, web space site, right? One of the things that happens in English, at least I'm probably sure it happens in other languages as well, is over the course of time, words that are used together a lot get smooshed. So for example, website, is now usually spelled as one word, website, no space between it. Another word that I thought was, was not smooshed actually is long standing. I noticed in something that I wrote recently, somebody corrected that, that um, you know, long standing, I thought was long dash standing, but probably the very fact that I said that probably dates me of, oh, that, that person learned to spell in the 1960s or something, because in modern English, that's smooshed as one word. That's an example of kind of evolution of language. And, and that's something that's always happening. And, and there are new words that get introduced. Sometimes there'll be a word that like blog, for example, that really that came from weblog and got shortened to blog, um, those kinds of things. 
Um, occasionally, there'll be there'll be names of products that sort of eventually just become part of the language, much to the horror of uh, typically of the companies that invented those names. Because one of the rules in in law about uh, trademarks, if if you say I'm using a um, I'm making a uh, famous example, I'm making a Xerox copy, uh, might just mean I'm making a photocopy of something. Um, but Xerox is a company still um, that uh, uh, you know was involved in making uh, photocop well xerography it was actually a greek word Z x x e r um, uh, i guess it's a chi uh, epsilon rho omega s sigma um, it's a it's a greek word which means dry because that was the that was the big innovation of making photocopies where where you just made the photocopy as a dry sheet of paper. Before that, when I was young, um, when you made copies of things, it involved some complicated sort of semi-photographic process that involved liquids and so on. So there were sort of non-dry photocopiers, but the big innovation of Xerox was the, the, the xerography, the dry copying type idea. But in any case, the, you know, the, the word that means making a copy, um, it's like... Um, uh, there's the generic making a copy, and then there's the specific brand name Xerox that is um, uh, um, uh, is is supposed to be something that a particular company owns. And, and the way law works, at least in the U.S., is there's this idea of trademarks, which is if you use a word to describe a thing that uh, is related to a product or service that you have, then it um, uh, if uh, you can, by, by the very fact that you're doing it and you're selling things under that name, um, the uh, within that class of, of goods that you're selling, let's say photocopies or something or copying devices, um, there is an assumption that you're the one who can, if, if you've developed a lot of effort selling things under that name, that you're the one who gets to control that name, um, at least so long as the name isn't so generic that um, uh, uh, that 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 you can't use it as a as a trademark, and so you know names like I don't know Apple and so on. People argue about whether that can be um, uh, how that you know what that can be a trademark for, and that that has long been settled in that particular case. But but um, in any case, so so there, that's another way that you know another way that words can can enter. But but so so the answer is I haven't really looked at the evolution of my personal vocabulary, but, but I wouldn't mind doing so. I think the question was about uh, audio recording. That's a more troublesome thing because I've tended not to do that because uh, although I've been doing it increasingly as we as we do meetings that are uh, through you know things like Zoom and so on, where uh, which we've been doing for years actually, um, where there's more of an expectation that you're going to record the thing. Um, generally, uh, in sort of everyday life. Um, it doesn't feel like the right thing to be recording everything one says to, I, mean, I don't mind recording the things I say, but uh, to record everything everybody else says is, is kind of kind of odd. Um, and I don't think that's sort of a, it's not a, a socially doable thing. You know, I used to have a little camera that I used to clip on that um, uh, used to, was, was, that took a picture every 15 seconds or so. And um, I found uh, in most kind of, social settings that was a uh i tried to figure out you know could i draw a little picture of an eye on it to show what it was or some such other thing because people were very confused by it um and uh you know did it really make any sense in the end i decided that for sort of most social settings it was just so weird uh, it was just uh you know in, in your face quite literally weirdness that was unnecessary but the one case where it was very useful is that at things like trade shows, and I suppose if I went shopping, although I don't usually, um, it would also be useful there. It's you're going to a trade show and there are all these booths where different companies are, are selling different kinds of things and you wander around there for, for a few hours or a day or something like that. And it's, um, I, I, um, uh, I, I use this little camera for that because it's a really useful thing because instead of having to remember, oh, I walked up to this booth and that was interesting and I had this interesting conversation for 10 minutes with somebody, it's like all that data is right there. And you can use, uh, you can just take those images and you can recognize the, you know, you can, you can do optical character recognition to recognize the words and you can, you can turn that all into something you can use. So that's a, 
that was that was a one use case. There's a question here uh, about does the system record all passwords that I use? Well, it it, it does key logging, so yes, it records everything I type, um, and uh, that's um, um, okay. Let's see. There was a question here, which seems very uh, pertinent for Mikhail. How do vaccines work? All right. Let's see if I can, I can tackle that one. Um, all right. So first question is, um, let's see where to start here. So um, the basic thing that happens when you get infected with something is you've got some foreign thing in your body, some antigen in your body that's a, a foreign thing that you don't want there. And what you really want is for your immune system to go and attack that foreign thing and get rid of it. Well, how does it know it's a foreign thing? How does it attack it? How does that work? In the end, so in the case of viruses, it's kind of an, uh, a difficult thing because a virus uh, takes over the, the operation of one of your cells. A bacterium is a cell itself and just circulates around your body. And um, you can kind of, you can things like antibiotics, for example, can affect the virus um, quite, quite separately because they're separate cells in your body. Um, and uh, for example, you can have something which could recognize, oh, that's a, that's a bacteria cell, as opposed to that's a cell that's part of, 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 of you yourself, so to speak. In the case of viruses, it's a little bit more complicated because the virus actually goes in and sort of takes over the, um, the, the, the system inside your cells that makes proteins in your cells and so on, and makes, makes copies of the virus instead of making things that your, your cell kind of uh, should be making, so to speak. So, so to recognize a cell that has been infected by a virus, what, when you get a virus, what happens is some small fraction of your cells get infected by the virus and the virus will take over those cells. How do you recognize those cells? Well, the point is that, that um, cells, all our cells, uh, have a mechanism where they take the proteins that are being made inside the cells and they take little pieces of those proteins and they have a sort of conveyor belt mechanism with, with molecules basically that takes those, those fragments of, of proteins that are getting made uh, of, of um, uh, actually of, of the, 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 the RNA that's the template for those proteins and moves them to the cell surface and exposes them on the cell surface. And so it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of a, a declaration of um, uh, what's inside the cell. I mean, all our cells are kind of declaring on their cell surface something about what's going on inside the cell. And that's what potentially allows one to recognize, oh, whoops, that's a, a, a cell that's been taken over by a virus. We better do something about it. Now, in the end, the thing that does something about it is one of our white blood cells, um, a particular kind called a killer T cell, is the thing that eventually will go and, uh, and basically kill off that infected cell um, so that it can't, can no longer, uh, so the virus inside it can no longer replicate and so on. Okay, so how does that, how does any of that stuff work? Basically what has to happen is you have to, in your body, the immune system, which is basically uh, well, there's two pieces to the immune system. There's a so-called primitive immune system that exists in uh, even lower organisms. And there's the, um, uh, the, so that's the so-called innate immune system. Then there's the adaptive immune system, which is the thing that us mammals, and I think a few levels down from mammals have, um, that is an immune system where, where it is continually adapting and learning from things that it's seen before. And so, uh, the, the immune system that's relevant for vaccines and so on is the adaptive immune system, the higher level immune system that, that us mammals have, for example. Okay, so how does this work? Well, the, um, the basic idea is that you're, you're trying to recognize what cells are declaring things that are just uh, uh, proteins, RNA fragments, whatever, that are things that are that you, are part of you 
versus what are declaring things that are some foreign invaders. How do you tell that? Well, the, um, what, you, what basically has to happen is that there are, um, uh, you're, it's, it's a very kind of mathematical thing. In the end, you're exposing sequences, genome sequences, you know, A, T, G, C, T, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're asking, does this particular genome sequence um, occur in, in me or does it never occur in me? And by the time, if, if you just asked, so, so our genome sequences consist of about, for humans, about us humans, that, that's who we're all, that's, that's who's having this discussion here. Um, is uh, consists of about six billion base pairs. Each base pair is just a particular configuration of atoms um, that are all strung together on our DNA molecules. And um, each, each of those base pairs is a handful of atoms, maybe a, a dozen or, or two atoms representing each base pair. And, and that um, is, uh, uh, and those are, there are four possibilities on the DNA is, has two strands, but that doesn't, that's not relevant for what we're talking about here. But there's the, each of us is kind of specified by the particular sequence of 6 billion A, T, G, C uh, um, base pair sequences. There are these four possible bases, um, A, T, C, G, and um, we're, we're specified by the, the, the sequence of 6 billion of those things. Each of us has a different 6 billion uh, of those things slightly. Uh, the, 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 there's, there's rather small differences, I think. Um, what fraction is it? It's, um, hmm, I've forgotten. I think it's about, about 700,000 are usually absolutely unique to an individual person. Um, and many more than that differ between people, but there will be many uh, sort of people who have that same uh, sort of different piece of the sequence. So, okay. That's, that's how you sort of specify us as the six billion base pairs. Like the attacking virus, the, the, the virus, the coronavirus that's caused us all this pandemic trouble, it has only 29,000 base pairs. So it's really tiny compared to our, uh, our six billion base pairs. Um, but uh, the question is, what um, if, if a piece of that viral uh, genome was the thing that was exposed on the surface of the cell representing the fact that sort of declaring the fact that there's some of this stuff going on inside the cell, um, how would we tell that a piece of that, if, if there's a piece of that virus genome exposed as compared to a piece of our normal genome exposed? And I, I, I think the, the, there's, the question is how many A, T, G, C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do you need to have before it becomes extremely unlikely that, um, that, that that sequence will occur, um, uh, well, okay, so, so within us, if we look at, let's say, um, length, let's say length 10 sequences, there are uh, length 10 sequence of A, T, G, C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there are four to the power 10 um, possible, uh, uh, possible length 10 sequences, because at every position, there's four possibilities and there's 10 such positions. So it's four times, four times, four times, four, 10 times gives the total number of possible sequences of length 10. So four to the 10 is, uh, let's see, roughly, uh, roughly a trillion, I think. Um, so that means that of a length 10 sequence, there are a trillion possible sequences of length 10. So the chances are in our 6 billion base pairs, the chances are there'll be plenty of those length 10 sequences that just don't occur in our 6 billion base pair uh, length piece of DNA. Um, and let, let's maybe make it a bit longer, let's say length 12, that would be, let's say, um, um, that, that would be, let's say, you know, a few hundred trillion um, uh, different possible length 12 sequences. Okay, so if you, if you say, okay, then, then um, uh, but it could be the case, but th th that, if we compare that now with what exists in, let's say, the virus, the virus will have different length 12 sequences. And the chances are that it's the length 12 sequences in its viral genome will be length 12 sequences that just never occur in our genome. 
Okay, so as soon as you see that length 12 sequence declared on a cell surface, it's saying, oops, that's not something that came from us. That's some foreign thing. Maybe that's something like this virus. Okay, so, so the basic thing you're looking for is sequences that basically we know can't be part of us and therefore have to be some, some sort of foreign attacker. Okay, so that's, that's the basic thing you're looking for. The, the question is, what's the actual mechanism for recognizing these foreign sequences? Okay, so again, biology is always quite complicated and, and I'm not sure it's always even difficult for me to remember all the different pieces of, of how all this works. But let me try and give you a, a, a rough overview. Okay, so there are these things called antibodies. Famous, uh, famous idea. Antibodies are associated with B cells, which are a type of white blood cell. Um, the, um, the, the, the idea of antibodies, they are a type of um, molecule called immunoglobulin, they're a type of protein, um, and they have, the, they're usually they're kind of Y-shaped molecules. And one feature they have is that there are many different variants of, these, of this antibody molecule, of this immunoglob these immunoglobulins. And those many different variants basically correspond to they, they have representations of different possible genome-like sequences on them. And they, they have these variable regions. So, so your average protein in your body, there's just one form of it. You know, your average, I don't know, muscle protein actin, let's say, or your average whatever, there's, uh, you may have a variant that's a little bit different than somebody else's version of that protein, but they'll typically be just one different, one configuration, one one form of that protein with one particular uh, sequence that, um, of, of amino acids that makes it and so on. In the case of these uh, antibody immunoglobulins, um, there are many different possible sequences. So there's this region on the antibody that has a high variation. It, it's a sequence that has, of which there are many possibilities of what it can be. I think in, in the case of standard antibodies, there are maybe 10 billion different possible antibodies that can circulate in us. So what is the point of these antibodies? The point of these antibodies is they, uh, of these 10 billion antibodies, they are basically looking for particular sequences that might be exposed on the surface of a cell. And the way biology is, uh, you know, sort of works all through biology is biology is about kind of molecules that fit into each other. So for instance, you know, one molecule may have a particular hole that's a particular shape and another molecule may be uh, just have a little sort of proboscis that sticks out that fits in that hole. And so then those two molecules will bind to each other and the result will be some chemical process that will be sort of a, have a chemical consequence that is part of the operation of a biological system. So the same thing is, is what's happening with these antibodies. They have uh, the 10, let's say 10 billion different kinds of antibodies with each with little different sort of sequence regions on them. And depending on which cells, depending on what the exposed sort of declaration on the out, outside of cells is, these antibodies will either, uh, a particular one of those 10 billion antibodies will either bind or not bind to that cell. And so essentially what's happening is, and I, I'm, I'm forgetting the actual lengths of the, um, uh, the sequences, they're on the order of 10, but I, I forget how, how long the actual uh, sequences are that, um, that, are, that are used for these identifications. Um, the, the thing, the idea is that uh, all your various antibodies, 10 billion different kinds of antibodies that are sort of randomly generated in your body, um, the randomly generated by the uh, um, uh, different B cells will each generate a different kind of antibody and they'll be randomly generated um, and you'll get sort of a random collection of these 10 billion antibodies. Um, and then some of those antibodies will be the antibody that binds to the particular sequence associated with those cell, with the virus, let's say, or, or the, with fragments of the virus, and will be the things that are exposed on the surface of cells that have been infected by the virus. So then what happens is that those, so that's the normal state of affairs. These, these antibodies are going around, they're kind of searching around, they're trying to find, you know, is there anything is, uh, oh, I, I forgot one very important thing. When you're a kid, these antibodies are trained to, the, the, the whole system is trained to recognize what sequences are just part of you. 
and what sequences should be thought of as being foreign intruders. So when, when you're a kid, you it's particularly associated with the thing called the thymus gland, which is some gland in the sort of chest type area. Um, and uh, that is, is active when you're, when you're a kid. And it's part of, of sort of training your immune system to know what's you and what's, uh, and what's what should be considered a, a foreign outside intruder, so to speak. And so that's, so what, what happens is um, most of the time, you know, the, the whole system of antibodies and so on, they go around and, and most of the time it's, it's like if, if something is just, I'm, I'm forgetting a little piece of this, this whole setup, but, but basically what's happening is when it's something that is known to be just you, the thing says, oh, that's fine. That's, that's something that's just you, not a problem. Occasionally, if you're infected by a virus or if there are bacteria that, that uh, invade you or whatever else, the thing will say, no, 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 that's the thing. That's something that isn't just you. That's something different. And it will then bind to that. And that will start a cascade that makes more antibodies of that kind be produced. More B cells get produced, more antibodies of that type get produced. And that's how we mount a defense against an, a, an attacking um, infection. So what's happening is the, the, this random set of, you know, all these different antibodies, the 10 billion different kinds of antibodies or whatever, all circulating around. If one of them um, is a match for some intruder, that, it will, that will be detected and more of that kind of antibody will be produced. What's the point of the antibodies? The point of the antibodies is they essentially mark cells that are like, this is a bad cell. Once the antibody is bound to it, it's kind of known to be a bad cell. And then other kinds of cells, these T cells, um, come and know that this marked cell should be killed off. And so they then go and do that, um, uh, do that work of killing off the cell. But the antibodies are kind of marking which cells should be, should be killed off. And um, so, okay, so then, then in normally what happens is you get an infection, all those 10 billion antibodies are all going around and eventually uh, you know, the, the infection will be recognized by whatever antibody is a match for the fragments of the, the genome or whatever of, of the infector. Um, and then those, uh, um, those, those antibodies will be, will be amplified and you'll gradually mount this immune response over the course of you know, a few days or something. You'll mount this immune response and more and more antibodies will be produced, more and more cells will get marked, more and more T cells will come in and kill those cells, and you'll fight off the infection. That's kind of the normal way that the adaptive immune system fights off infection. Okay, what's the point of a vaccine? The point of a vaccine, oh, I, I should explain another thing. Once you've been infected with something, then uh, there will be forever some sort of memory B cells, some, some memory of the fact that this is something, this is a kind of antibody that's worth having around because gosh, that's a kind of infection that exists in the world. Of all the 10 billion possible antibodies, most of them have probably never been associated with any actual infection that's ever existed anywhere. But the ones that have been, are the ones that in your lifetime you have been exposed to you will end up with a mechanism for keeping around more of the B cells that make those antibodies. And so what will then happen is, if you ever get that attacked by that, you know, by that uh, infector, infective agent again, then your immune system will be much more ready to jump into action, produce antibodies, start this whole mechanism, get rid of the, um, uh, the, the attacker, much more efficiently than it was first time around. Because first time around, it had to kind of notice, oh yeah, one of these circulating antibodies is a match for this attacker. Let's amplify that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Second time around, you've probably got some whole bunch of, of B cells and their corresponding antibodies ready to jump into action and immediately start attacking the thing that's, that's, um, that's infecting you. And chances are they'll atta that attack will be mounted before you even know that you have the infection. Um, before you even start up all these other cascades that increase your fever, you know, give you a fever and all these other kinds of things. It's a whole different, different story about how that works. But so the question is, um, okay, so given that whole setup, what's the point of a vaccine? The point of a vaccine 
is to give you the equivalent of having had uh, exposure to, uh, to that antigen, to that infecting agent, to give you the equivalent and to have you have mounted a similar kind of antibody response and to give you that, that same sort of collection of B cells and so on that will be capable of remount of, of, in, of, of mounting a response were you to actually be infected by that agent. So when you, uh, if you get a vaccine for something, I don't know, measles or something like this, then the idea is that um, you will mount an immune response at the time of the measles vaccine, and that immune response will be sufficient to get your immune system, kind of teach your immune system how to make antibodies um, that can deal with a, a genuine measles infection if one came along later. So that's the idea. So first, there are many, many different issues. So one, one issue is that um, there's the question of, okay, how come your immune system, uh, when you get the measles vaccine, is responding strongly enough to give you the same kind of immunity that actually getting measles would have? Because you don't want to, if the measles vaccine gave you measles, then kind of that's pointless. What you want is the vaccine to get your immune system so energized that it will mount a big immune response to measles without you actually getting measles and having the, having the disease, being sick. So how does that work? So it's a trick, which was discovered, what, by Jenner and people ooh, 150 years ago, is that right, roughly? Um, the, um, and the, the trick is that, okay, so first point is you might, um, uh, let's say you just give somebody a very tiny amount of the um, measles as a virus, a little tiny amount of that virus. Um, let's say you gave that virus in a form, again, I'm, I have to explain a few other things here, but um, let, let, me, let me make, the, the main point is you, you're, what you've got to do is put something in your body which sort of walks and talks like a measles virus or whatever, um, but can't actually infect you in the way that that virus can, can infect you. Actually, um, and, and so what happens is the, there are different schemes for how different kinds of vaccines work. There are live virus vaccines, killed virus vaccines, virus fragment vaccines, et cetera. Um, the, uh, but the idea is that you, you are going to get injected into you something which is something like the virus that could infect you. And the idea is that the thing that gets injected into you as the vaccine is going to be something which to your immune system looks like the thing that the virus that might subsequently attack you. Um, and so your immune system will then say, okay, this is an antigen. I want to mount a, a, an attack against this antigen. Um, and, and, and then, so it will end up mounting this immune response, which will give you, uh, which will then produce this whole sort of collection of memory, B cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that will remember the, um, uh, the, 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 that particular kind, kind of antigen and give you defense against that antigen. Okay, the problem is, how do you get the immune system to be uh, sort of energetic enough in saying, I want to mount a really big immune response so that I store lots of, make lots of memory B cells and so on and store lots of stuff away without you getting sick, without you having to get sort of a systemic infection, so to speak, um, to, to get the immune system to be, to be that active. So the trick is, uh, an additional kind of substance that's part of, of vaccines, I guess called the adjuvant, um, which is another kind of uh, material that isn't, has nothing to do with the, um, uh, the actual fragment of virus or whatever it is that you're trying to become immune to. It's simply something, and there are various different forms of it, it's, it's simply something that, um, uh, that, um, um, uh, that, that um, uh, is intended to get your immune system all wound up so that it uh, will 
uh, mount a big response to the thing that is actually being used to make the vaccine. So this, this, uh, what, what, what tends to happen is you get the vaccine injected, it's injected in, you know, um, uh, into muscle or something. And, and, um, uh, it's, um, and then this adjuvant gets your, uh, your innate immune system so wound up that it's going to basically parade immune cells past that site. It's going to say there's something really funky going on here. Get all that, get those immune system cells to come check out what's happening. And so by doing that, it's, it's um, that, that adjuvant is, is getting the immune system wound up locally. So it's going to take a bunch of immune system cells and it's going to say, come check this out, come mount a response to the thing that's here. And, and typically when people have sort of bad reactions to vaccines, the most common issue is that adjuvant, not the actual vaccine thing itself. Then there are various, um, uh, very, various issues with that. That's, that's the thing to watch out for more so than the actual vaccine itself. Um, but, um, and, and they're usually different and it's sort of a big art form to get sort of adjuvants that, that have the right level of activity that, that produce the right amount of sort of uh, make the immune system pay attention to this and so on. Okay, so next question is, uh, when you try and make a vaccine, what part of the, uh, the, the, the potential attacker, the virus, whatever it is, what part of that is the vaccine. So for instance, if you have um, a virus, it'll have, you know, let's say the 29,000 base pair uh, RNA virus that is the thing that's producing COVID-19 and so on. Um, what, uh, you know, that virus has this particular form. It has these spike proteins sticking out of it that make its whole sort of crown-like, uh, uh, um, you know, pictures and so on. It has a bunch of different, um, different pieces to it. And when, when that virus is being made in a cell, the, the, all those different pieces will get exposed on the, on the cell. And what you have to do, one thing you have to do is pick which of those pieces are you going to use to say, this is the one that we're going to teach our immune systems to go and attack. And, and, and so you have to pick something which is it's hopefully a piece of the virus that is likely to be as the virus mutates and viruses every couple of weeks, I think, uh, you know, a virus as it passes from person to person and so on will mutate by one base pair or so. So it's gradually, you know, there, and there are many, many, many different versions of the, of the um, coronavirus now of, of the COVID-19 um, virus that exist. And they all differ by, by small amounts. And one of the tricks in, in designing a vaccine is to make sure that you end up with something which is generic enough that it's very unlikely that you'll still have a working virus if that particular part of the, of the sequence of the virus was changed. Now, of course, things are, as usual, more complicated than, than in biology than, than you can ever expect, but there is a, a notion of kind of cross-reactivity. That is, it could be the case that the sequence is precisely blah, 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 but a sequence is just one off will still be close enough that there'll be a reasonable amount of, act of, of reaction to that. So that even if you were off by one or something, you'll still uh, correctly be able to have the vaccine produce the correct kind of immune response, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, so then is the question, boy, this is complicated, sorry. Um, that's, I, I, you know, I, I suppose that uh, this is just the way that biology has evolved to um, uh, and I'm I'm skating over lots of lots of details, and there are also lots of details that I probably don't know. Um, but uh, uh, but basic point is that um, what you've got to do to make a vaccine is have something in the vaccine that is sort of enough relevant pieces of the antigen that your that that um, that you then mount a, an immune response to. And then when the actual, if the actual virus infects you, then you'll say, oh, I know that's a bad thing. I've already got a bunch of antibodies to that, which are, um, but by that it's, well, that particular section, I know, I know it's bad because I see this particular section and I have things that can mount an attack on any cell that has this particular sequence associated with it. Okay. So, uh, 
one of the issues. So in the case of, of, of this particular uh, 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 COVID-19 virus, um, the, um, uh, one of the things that's been done that's never been done before is um, to make vaccines using messenger RNA. Um, and what the idea there is, um, normally you'll do things like take an actual virus and kill it and um, take fragments of the virus and that will become the vaccine and you have this whole setup. But in the case of, of this um, messenger RNA setup, what you're doing is you're using pieces of messenger RNA that are um, uh, messenger RNA is, is what actually specifies to one of your cells, go make this protein. It's the template that basically specifies something you should make. And, and so the idea here is that you're going to deliver actual pieces of directly deliver pieces of programs to our cells to tell them to make things which are the things that that would be part of a vaccine to this particular virus. And one of the, the most tricky things that took like a decade to figure out was how to deliver that mRNA into the right part of the cell so that it could be um, uh, um, uh, so, so, so it could be, um, uh, so it could actually operate and, and, and be, be used by the apparatus in the cell. And it, it's, it's usually embedded in these tiny little nano, what are they called? Um, little nano droplets um, that, uh, uh, and that's, that's the thing that, for example, when these vaccines have to be kept very cold and so on, it's to prevent those droplets from, from uh, breaking down and it's, it's within those droplets, those droplets are able to be ingested into a cell, get the mRNA to the right place in the cell, have it start being used by the cell, by the apparatus that the cell um, uses to, to make proteins and so on, to then produce the things that will expose on that cell, the things which are going to be the things that would be needed to train the immune system to go through this whole other, other set of things that, that one thinks about. By the way, to say one's injecting messenger RNA, one might say, oh my gosh, that means you're injecting something like the virus, but that's not true because all you're injecting is little, little fragments of messenger RNA, which directly are templates for making proteins. Viruses have RNA that has pieces in it that say how to replicate more virus which is a quite different thing. So that those, those viruses, the, the viral RNA um, is, has self-replication built into it so that it can make more viruses. These pieces of mRNA associated with these vaccines are just direct sort of instructions to, um, uh, to generate um, the, the appropriate proteins to, to, uh, uh, to, to provide the things you need for this vaccine. By the way, I mean, in the development of, you know, one of the things that may happen, uh, this notion of using mRNA to make vaccines is, is a really, it's not been done before. It's a, it's a new thing. It's kind of something where the science has really been accelerated by the need to do it right now. The original thing that mRNA vaccines were developed for was for dealing with cancer, where one is often wanting to, um, uh, you know, there's a question, why does the immune system not get rid of cancers when they show up? Well, because the immune system is confused because the cancer seems like it's one of your own cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you could kind of custom build some, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, you could custom set up a very particular immune response to the very particular form of cells that correspond to a cancer, then you could use your own immune system to fight cancer. It's an idea called immunotherapy, of which there are a bunch of trials and so on, but it's, an, it's actually a very old idea for how to, how to attack cancer. But one of the approaches to doing that is, well, you make a very custom vaccine based on the particular things that are features of the cells that are making your, your cancer. And so that's what this mRNA technology was developed for. Um, and uh, one of the consequences of, of the fact that it's been accelerated so much in usage right now may be a very a very interesting direction in, uh, in, in kind of being able to use immunotherapy against cancer um, using sort of custom built, uh, just as these vaccines were sort of custom built very quickly by the standards of vaccine development um, for this coronavirus. So similarly, you, you, you may be able to do that for a particular tumor that a particular person gets and so on. You may be able to build a vaccine specifically for that using same kind of technology. Now, uh, let's see, in, in terms of describing how the whole, um, 
mechanism of uh, of um, um, the vaccines and so on works. I mean, so so the big point is that you end up with this sort of larger number of antibodies against the thing that you want to subsequently attack. That's sort of what the vaccine achieves. Also, if you want to know where you sick with a particular thing, you can directly go and measure, and there are different uh, versions of this, there are different forms of immunoglobulin, IgG, IgM, IgE, et cetera, and they, there are different amounts of these that uh, exist at different stages in infection and, and for long-term memory of an infection. But you can go and basically measure how much antibody of the particular kind that would respond to a particular infection do you have? And that's the way to potentially tell whether you have had a given infection. Now, needless to say, in the, in the theory that biology is always more complicated than you can possibly imagine, um, that's not the whole story. Because in addition to immunity associated with antibodies, the adaptive immune system has another mechanism, quite different mechanism for producing immunity, so-called T cell immunity. Um, and what, what's happening there is just as there's this, this idea that you can have this marking of things by antibodies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there's a whole different mechanism that involves T cells being able to bind to cells and decide they're bad, helper T cells, I guess they are binding to cells, deciding they're bad, and then uh, causing those cells to be attacked by, by killer T cells and so on. Um, and so there's a thing called the T cell receptor, which is part of T cells, which also has this feature that has many different variants. And it can also, in a sense, learn from the existence of, of antigens and so on. T cell immunity is much less well understood than B cell mediated kind of standard sort of antibody type immunity. But it seems like for coronaviruses in particular, that T cell immunity is probably pretty important. It's also much harder to, to measure because the, these, these immunoglobulins that, that are the, the antibodies, you just, they sort of just fall off and they're, they're circulating little pieces of protein. And you can just kind of measure how many of those you have. Whereas for T cells, I think the only thing you can do is actually get the genome sequence of the T cell and things. And it's, it's all rather much more complicated. Um, so, but, but most likely some large fraction of the immunity to coronavirus is associated with T cells. So it's a little bit invisible in the whole antibody system. And exactly what the relationship of, of vaccines to stimulating that kind of immunity is, is, is less well understood um, because it's harder to measure and it's, the whole thing is much less well understood than the case of, of immunity associated with, um, uh, with, with the standard antibody response and so on. So, I mean, this is a very beginning. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the, just, to, just to give you some sense of how complicated things are in the immune system, there are, there are antibodies, um, and there are also, potentially, you can end up with a feedback loop where you're just producing more and more and more antibodies, which would be very bad. But then what you end up with is sort of anti-antibodies, which sort of reduce the number of antibodies. Once you have too many, it will reduce them. And what you end up with is this whole elaborate sort of dynamic equilibrium between different kinds of components in the immune system. And even people know that with T cells, actual T cells can go and you know, go and actually bind to each other and actually their actual physical interactions between T cells that are important in the way that the immune system works. It's a pretty complicated setup. It's a, it's a, a sort of very dynamic network of different, uh, different processes going on, still not very well understood. And um, there are uh, uh, clearly, uh, well, there are a lot of pieces to this that are um, important for understanding not only our response to disease, but also things like autoimmunity, when we get autoimmune diseases like, uh, oh, I don't know, asthma, type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lots of different kinds of, um, uh, uh, lots of different kinds of autoimmune diseases. And in autoimmune disease, what's happening is that it's, it's usually the T cells are deciding that something that is actually something that is you is, is they say, well, actually, no, I don't like that. It's, it, there must be something wrong with it. And they go and attack it. And so like in type one diabetes, they attack the beta cells of the pancreas um, and uh, as if that was a foreign invader. And so they destroy those cells. Um, and that's, um, uh, that, that's the, um, or in, in multiple sclerosis, it's the myelin sheaths of nerves and so on. So it's kind of making a mistake and it's saying, this is something, it, sh it should be just looking for foreign stuff, but it says this thing that's actually part of you seems to be something foreign and I need to go and attack it. 
And, and one of the things that's certainly been observed in the last few decades is a, a big increase in the amount of, uh, of autoimmune diseases that are seen in, in some countries like the US. And, and there's sort of a bunch of questions about why that's happening. I think one of the more prominent theories is the theory that we live a much cleaner life. You know, when we're kids now, growing up now, uh, you know, in the past, oh, we might have had all kinds of, uh, you know, we might have had parasites living in our guts because we've got, you know, we eat food that is, is, is um, you know, has little worms or something terrible in it or, or whatever. And we might have, you know, things are just much dirtier and we would get much more, much more disease when we're young and that um, the immune system will be trained in a different way by getting all this disease and will be more used to dealing with these outside intruders. And the theory is, that in sort of the modern, much cleaner world, the immune system kind of is like, I got to do something. And so it ends up going and attacking our own cells rather than or learning to attack our own cells rather than concluding that it should attack these, um, uh, these external um, cells. And um, uh, um, the thing that, um, Okay, so that was a very long description of, of something about vaccines. I think, um, uh, what else to say about them? Probably lots of things to say about them. Uh, there are, it's a, it's a kind of, there's a lot of cleverness involved in sort of all the trade-offs associated with um, how to get, um, uh, how, how a vaccine should be made to operate, how to make sure that it doesn't start producing some kind of weird autoimmunity response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And how to do that across everybody, um, because, because different people have different genomes, the, the details of what's self and what's not self and so on will be different between different people. Um, chances are that th the, the kinds of things that are found in a virus are so far away from any piece of a genome in any human that you don't really have to worry about it, but that's one of the issues. And, and, and what can also happen is that you say, well, I'm going to try for my vaccine. I'm going to try these particular pieces of a virus, for example. And it might be that those aren't pieces that uh, uh, are very good for, for, for the immune system to latch onto or for recognizing when, when the virus uh, attacks. And so those are some of the kinds of things that have to be tested in figuring out whether a vaccine is going to work. All right. The, let's see. That was a very long description. Let's see, were there questions about this? Let me, um, uh, okay, there was some questions about, um, 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 ba, 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 ba. let's see, from Prutz. If a disease is such that the thing which kills is the immune response. Could a vaccine based on these principles be dangerous? Okay, that's an interesting question. So, so one of the things that happens with COVID-19, for example, is that um, some of the more dangerous features of the disease are not the virus itself. They are the uh, response that your body has to the fact that there are cells infected with the virus, particularly in one's lungs, for instance. And there's, you know, lungs are very sensitive. They have, uh, what is it? I think 23 levels of branching of little tiny, tiny, tiny airways where, you're, where you have this very, very thin boundary between your, your bloodstream and the outside and, and the air, allowing oxygen from the air to pass into your bloodstream and so on and, uh, and, and go and um, uh, be, be delivered to your various tissues by red blood cells. But um, there's, th that can be very sensitive. And if, if, there's, if there starts to be inflammation, if there start to be kind of, if your body is kind of mounting a, um, a response, it can kind of gum up those little tiny airways. And that's really bad because it prevents the, the exchange of oxygen and prevents you from being able to successfully deliver oxygen to your, to your tissues and so on. So that, that whole cascade happens because there are lots of cells in your lungs that are infected by the virus, and those cells are locally stimulating some kind of inflammatory response. So when you have a vaccine, the vaccine, the, the actual things from the vaccine, they're just sitting in your arm or whatever. Um, they're, they're, they're not, those cells are not 
migrating around your body to start all kinds of other things happening. So, so that's not really a, a, an issue for that locally, you know, you could get some sort of local inflammation, you know, at the site of where the vaccine was given, but you're not going to get the, the, the cells that were, were uh, the, the things that were introduced when the vaccine was given. Uh, in the case of mRNA vaccines, it'll actually be cells that are, that are produced. Those cells aren't expected to kind of migrate around and start showing up and, and um, uh, having an effect elsewhere. In any case, those, those um, uh, yeah, so I think that that's, that's not something one should consider a likely risk. Um, it's only just the local thing of, of uh, you know, when for some vaccines, uh, you would actually get something which is very much like, like with the smallpox. Um, uh, let's see, some of these vaccines, I think smallpox did that, is that right? Some of these vaccines you might actually get, particularly from live virus, you might actually get, you know, one pock from the smallpox, so to speak right at that location. It doesn't migrate elsewhere in your body, but it does, it, it exists uh, right there, but, but doesn't start affecting other things. Okay, so somebody is commenting here that this is not how it works. Infection gets in, kills some cells, immune system picks up on the waste products. This triggers antibodies localized to the... In No, that's the innate immune system, not, um, I think, um, that, that's not the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the mechanism that I've been talking about is mostly antibodies, which is the adaptive immune system. Um, but, you know, I have to say doing this whole um, description of all of these aspects of biology from memory is, is, a, is, um, uh, is challenging um, because, um, but uh, I think I think I have it right. Um, let's see. Um, well, let me just address maybe one or two other questions here. Um, there's a question from it. David. Uh, it's more a history question. Have I met Tim Berners Lee, Doug Engelbart, Ed Feigenbaum, Shafi Goldwasser? Yes, I think I do. I do 100% on that. I've actually not, I, I never met Doug Ongam up. We had a long phone conversation once. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hitting four for four in terms of networking there. Um, let's see. Uh, Boy. Um, there's a lot of very interesting questions here. My gosh. The, um, all right, I'll, I'll address a couple here. Um, Udesio saying, his three-year-old sister uh, tells him that she doesn't like math and doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, how to change somebody's mind about math? You know, it's a little bit of a question what math is and, um, uh, and what, you know, unfortunately, math that gets taught in school is not necessarily the most interesting aspects of math. Um, you know, I think the essence of what math is is about kind of taking these concepts like numbers and geometry and so on, and seeing what can be figured out from those things. So I would say the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the challenge in, in, in having people be interested in math is there's math over here, which is some kind of abstract thing, and there's what somebody is interested in over here. And the question is, is there a bridge between this abstract thing and something someone is interested in? So for instance, if people are interested in kind of visual kinds of things, well, there's things you can do with math to make visual kinds of things, whether it's, oh, I don't know, things with polyhedra or whether it's things with cellular automaton patterns, things like that. There are kind of uh, ways to take things that are kind of mathy things and, um, and make them visual or, or things where one might be curious. You know, you take a polyhedron, you take some, and you say, you know, how many corners does it have? How many edges does it have? How many faces? 
let's do a piece of arithmetic and, and compare those and discover Euler's formula that connects those things by looking at different polyhedra. I mean, there, there, are, there are sort of different kinds of mathy things that um, um, I think uh, are potentially interesting to people. Another one that I've, I've tried on kids a bunch of times and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, is um, just, uh, you know, for kids who know some arithmetic, um, is, is like, do the thing, just take a pair of numbers, one plus one equals two, uh, two plus one equals three, keep doing this, but you never, one, once you get to, uh, you'll get up to five plus eight, um, and you might say that's equal to 13, but just ignore the one at the beginning of that. Just say five plus eight, and just keep only the ones, uh, only the, the units column, five plus eight, plus eight equals three, let's say. You're just keeping the, um, you're doing it mod 10, you're ignoring the, um, uh, the, the multiples of 10 and so on. Keep doing that, start with one plus one, keep doing that same thing. What you're making is, you know, in a mathy level is the Fibonacci sequence mod 10. It's kind of an interesting exercise, see what happens with that sequence. You'll discover something interesting if you do it. And um, that's a good, uh, that's, that's something, I don't know, some, uh, in my observation, some fraction of young kids get really interested in what's going to happen and, um, and then eventually discover it and get, get rather excited. Um, but you know, there are different kinds of things that are, I think the challenge is, what is somebody interested in? How does that relate to kinds of ab abstract concepts that, um, that we usually associate with math? Um, now there's a question here, what are time crystals? Um, as a friend of mine, actually, who um, who I think developed those ideas, but um, here's let me let me try a little bit of an explanation of this. What is a crystal? Crystal is a uh, you know when you have a solid, it has atoms in it, and the question is how are those atoms arranged? And the answer is in a crystal, the atoms are arranged in a very regular way. So there'll be a whole grid, and the crystal, depending on their different kinds of crystals, a seventeen standard kinds, I guess, and that they're, they're all different kinds of grids, like a salt crystal, sodium chloride, is a cubic crystal, and the atoms in that cubic crystal are arranged on a cubic lattice. So, so there's kind of a whole three-dimensional grid of where the, where the atoms are arranged, and it's all in little cubic pieces that are, that are all uh, stuck together. And um, so it's, it's just a, an arrangement where there's, there's a whole uh, grid of cubes. So diamond, for example, has a different way that the atoms are arranged, but it's always very regular. There's a kind of a, a whole regular grid of things there. And so if you look at one piece of a, of a crystal and um, it'll always look the same, the configuration of atoms in one piece of the crystal will always be exactly the same as the configuration of atoms in another piece of the crystal. That's kind of the definition of a crystal that it has that kind of uh, periodic regularity that it's made of these sort of identical units that just get repeated over and over again. So that's an ordinary crystal. So another kind of thing is a liquid crystal. So a liquid crystal is, is something where there are molecules that are big, long, stringy molecules, um, like cholesterol is, is, uh, is happens to be one that's commonly used, I guess, as a uh, common type of thing that, that can act this way. And the point is that, the, um, that these molecules, they usually, uh, in a liquid crystal, what happens is the position of these molecules is kind of random, but the molecules are all lined up in the same direction. So, so that even though the positions, even though where these molecules are is random, the orientation of the molecules, which are long stringy molecules, the orientation is, um, actually they're not so long molecules, but, but they're, they're, they're molecules with a definite direction to them. They're all, all lined up in a liquid crystal. And that's why, for example, light gets polarized when it can go when it goes through a liquid crystal because it, it can only the only the vibrations of light um, that are sort of along the direction of of these of these sort of fingers can get through, and the ones opposite to that, the, the ones at ninety degrees to that, can't. So okay, that's a liquid crystal. Okay, so the idea of a time crystal is something where the the atoms aren't arranged in things things aren't arranged in a um, in a definite uh, sort of periodic arrangement in space, they're not arranged in a definite orientation, but instead in time, things keep on coming back to being the same again. It's something where there's sort of a repeating thing happening in time. That's the idea. 
I think there are some places where this has potentially been observed, um, but that's um, that's kind of the notion is is when when it's the, it's it's a pure thing where what, what you're having is something where the mechanics of the system it may rattle around all over the place, but every so often it's coming back to exactly the same form. And I mean, there are there are simple cases where that happens with waves and things like this, but there are more elaborate cases potentially with materials where you can have things like that happen. That that's the idea, at least. There's a question from Radmir here. Do we have an explanation of why people have a sense of discreteness, talking about symbols and objects and so on? Is the world implicitly discrete or do we just perceive it that way? Oh, that's an interesting question. So in our current theory of physics that, that I've had the pleasure of developing over the last year or so, it looks like we're discovering that ultimately the universe really is made of discrete things. But those discrete things, those kind of atoms of space are really, really tiny, perhaps 10 to the minus 100 meters across, or that, that, that's their effective size. So that's really, really tiny compared to anything that we experience. So at the level at which we're dealing with things, the fact that the universe may ultimately may, be made of discrete things is sort of irrelevant. Now the question is, when we choose to think about things, how come we we, we see the world made of these, you know, uh, trillions and trillions of objects. And we, in order for us to reason about what's happening in the world, we don't want to talk individually about all these trillions and trillions of objects. We instead want to um, uh, be able to talk about, um, uh, we, we, we don't, our brains don't let us kind of independently reason about all the different objects, all the different atoms that are, are floating around. Our brains like to find it, find it only possible to have sort of a, a, a single thread of things that we're thinking about. And, and there we have to kind of bucket together lots of different detailed, oh, there's, this is what's happening in all these different million atoms that are going on. We have to say, uh, you know, that's a, um, uh, you know, th that, that's a chair or something. All those atoms that make up the chair, we just describe it as that's a chair rather than individually talking about all those individual atoms because our brains are not well suited to tracking all those, all those millions of different thing, atoms in the chair. Our brains kind of want to have this one kind of symbolic object that they're talking about. Now, why is this? Does it need to be that way? Uh, my guess is that in a recent, uh, uh, some recent thinking I've done about this, my guess is that it's a very fundamental feature of the thing that we think of as consciousness, that it has this kind of notion of a single thread that we don't get to talk about sort of all these different things going on. We're insisting on sort of talking about a single thread of things going on. I mean, another way to put it is we could try to describe the world in terms of all those separate atoms doing their separate thing. But that would take a huge amount of computation to know what was going to happen in the world. Much better that we'd be able to say, pick up the chair, it will move in this way, rather than study each individual atom in the chair and say what it will do. We want to be able to, if, if we have only a limited amount of computational ability, we have to be able to sort of group things together and say, let's talk about the whole chair rather than talking about the individual atoms in the chair. So I think that it's a feature of the fact that we have limited computational ability, that we uh, choose to describe the world in terms of these aggregate things, because if we didn't do that, we could not make any predictions about how the world works, because we'd have to talk about all these different tiny little incoherent pieces that make up the, um, uh, the, the, the elements of the world, uh, rather than being able to use a limited amount of computation to say some general things about what's going to happen in the world. Now, why is it possible to do that? Could it be the case that we live in a world where there are no aggregate things to talk about, where, where the aggregates you know, dissolve immediately and where there's no coherence to what's happening in the world? That's an interesting question. I think that in our, in our theory of physics, what we've learned is that there are particular forms of coherence in the world that are actually summarized pretty well by the, the two great pillars of 20th century physics, relativity and quantum mechanics, um, and that those, those are kind of what tell us that there is a way to talk about features of the world coherently, so to speak. It might not be the case. It might be the case that every atom you have to talk about separately. But in fact, we know that that isn't true, that we can still have 
useful things to say by talking about these atoms in the aggregate. Now, our uh, it's sort of a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because in a sense, the things we choose to interact with are the things about which we can talk uh, in the aggregate, so to speak. You know, there are things that might exist in the physical world that will be very difficult for us to reason about, but we don't choose to use those for our technology or sort of they don't show up in our everyday lives. Our, our biological evolution has not led us to have sensors for those things and so on. In other words, the things that are part of our experience and part of the world that we build for ourselves are things that we are capable of kind of uh, handling in this way where, where we can use only limited computational resources to be able to handle those things. And as I say, my guess is that there's sort of a, a, a whole kind of connection with the thing that we have the perception of being consciousness, that is this sort of notion of being able, of dealing with things with a sort of single thread of, of, um, uh, of kind of coherent um, experience rather than something where we're breaking into all these different threads of experience, that that's, that's an essential feature of the way that we sort of think about thinking about things, so to speak. So that was a, so, so I think my answer is that the fact that the world can be broken into these kind of coherent lumps that we can talk about symbolically, objects and things like this, that is an interesting feature of sort of the fundamental basic science of how the world is put together. It is, I believe, an inevitable feature of this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence, which I think is a really core principle that is just a, an abstract principle that turns out to be true. It's not obvious that it will be true, but it turns out to be true. Um, and it, it turns out abstractly, um, it seems to be true. And um, that, that principle, that one principle has sort of a bunch of trickle down effects one of which is a thing called causal invariance, which then has the effect that it becomes possible to identify these aggregate features of the world um, that, uh, th that exist. Then those are reflected in some of the principles we've learned in physics, for example, and those are the things that we are keying into to kind of be able to reason about the world. Now, you know, an interesting question is, the kind of the potential, you know, extraterrestrial intelligences, the other intelligences, so to speak, do they key into the same aspects of the world? Do they identify the same kinds of objects? If they have bounded computational resources as well, and inevitably they, they will have, if, if they, um, uh, in order to act as something which could plausibly be considered a consciousness-like thing, I think they sort of have to have bounded computational resources, then it, um, uh, the question is, do they key into the same kind of, uh, you know, making things into objects and symbolic and so on as we do? And the answer is, there's no reason to think they would. And um, there are probably sort of utterly different views of the universe that might still at some level, are still at some level, the description of the same kind of computational uh, uh, infrastructure of the universe, but it's described in an utterly different way. It's not described in terms of space and time and objects and so on. It's described in some way that is completely alien to us and which I have a hard time even imagining, but it's an interesting thing to try to think about. What is the kind of utterly different description of the world that you could have that could still ultimately be at a formal level describing the same world, but it's utterly different. And the things we consider to be objects, oh yeah, it's a chair, could be to somebody else, oh, that's you know, some very incoherent thing, and only the combination of the chair and the air around it and this and that and the other, that's the thing that we identify as an object. All right, I should, um, uh, I should probably uh, I'll be wrapping up soon. I'm rather late for something else I was supposed to be doing, but you guys are asking such interesting questions. Um, okay, there's a history question here from Don. I'm, I'm going to do another uh, history q and I think next Wednesday. So let's let's put that in that. Um, uh, oh boy. Okay, there are so many questions here. Well, um, um, yeah, I think I have to. I think I have to take these another time. There's an interesting question from Mark here about uploading data about human body and fixing everything. Uh, if we have the computing power and sort of AI, 
to understand things. Um, can we do that? You know, it's a tricky thing because we are the only known example of molecular scale computing. The computers we have operate in a very different way from the way we operate. We operate using these chemical processes that happen at a molecular scale. We don't even have a good kind of, uh, we, can, we can emulate those processes, but they're definitely not happening in the same kind of molecular way that they happen in us. I've, I've actually recently been thinking about ways to think about the kind of molecular processes uh, the computations that happen in sort of molecular processes in us. But um, uh, there's also the question of, you know, we're a pretty complicated computation that's going on. All our cells in our bodies are doing all these complicated things. And you say, well, something's going wrong, whatever wrong means. Um, it, it's, um, uh, you know, can we fix it? That's a tricky thing. It's a very difficult thing. We don't even know how to do that for a computer operating system. We don't even know if your computer operating system is running and it's going to crash sometime. Um, your computer's going to die in effect. Um, you know, how do we avoid that happening? What bits do we have to change in the running operating system to prevent it from crashing? That's a difficult problem, which we don't know very much about. And that's what we kind of have to emulate if we're going to think about how to do that for humans. And also in the case of humans, we've got to deliver that um, in uh, sort of at, at the right molecular scale in the right place to be able to make that intervention, so to speak. And I think in terms of, of the um, uh, sort of, can you just take, uh, you know, let's say the content of a brain and just emulate it and sort of upload it and have a, an uploaded consciousness, so to speak, that, that is just like us. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a tricky, almost philosophical question. Um, at what point, uh, you know, how, to what extent you know, it, to what extent is that? Is that you know, if you have a copy of yourself that is a, a perfect copy of all the operation of your neurons, is it you, so to speak? Do you have the perception that it's you? Is it is it you? Um, and I think that's a maybe we can discuss this another time. There's a whole uh, sort of collection of philosophical issues about this. There's usually this uh, uh, ship of Theseus problem where somebody says, "I've got a ship. It's Theseus's ship." And um, it's uh, and now, oh, a piece of it breaks. So I'm going to replace that part. I'm going to replace all the planks on this. And eventually, I'm going to replace the mast of the ship. I'm going to replace the rudder of the ship. I'm going to replace this part of the ship. I'm going to replace that part of the ship. And pretty soon, there's no piece of timber on the ship. This is from ancient times. Um, there's no piece of timber on the ship that's the same as it was when Theseus had the ship. Is it still the ship of Theseus or not? You know, what makes it the same thing, even though all its parts have been replaced? And that's kind of part of the issue of kind of uh, as you, for example, let's say you incrementally sort of start sharing your memories with some external digital device, or you even do a single uploading event. What is it, you know, to what extent is it you and to what extent is it not you? Interesting philosophical question, maybe for another time. All right. Um, thank you very much for a lot of... Um, Really, uh, um, oh, I have, there's one last question. I can't resist this one. Has anyone looked at the complexity of a cell? Can we not say that it exhibits intelligence? Can intelligence exist without brains? You know, in, in my kind of view of, of sort of how things work, a lot of the story is about computation. If you have some formal piece of input and you have a system that is going and figuring out things from that input according to rules, that's sort of that's doing a computation, and that's the core of what intelligence is doing. It is doing computations like that, and there is nothing to say that the the kind of um, the 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 thing that we call intelligence has to exist in, in our particular example of it exists in human brains and all that kind of thing. But this, as soon as you have a system that it does any kind of sophisticated computation, it's intelligence of some sort. It isn't human intelligence necessarily, unless we sort of very specifically set it up that way. It's intelligence, but it's kind of alien intelligence that we can't necessarily relate to, but it is nevertheless intelligence. And when you ask, you know, can a cell be intelligent in that sense? The answer I suspect is, is yes, in this sense. The question is, can we tell, can we relate its kind of computation, its thinking, so to speak, to what we humans do. I mean, if we take the immune system, for instance, you know, there are all these complicated interactions between cells and all that kind of thing. Can we, um, can we, um, uh, can we relate that to, um, uh, 
you know, are those things doing something that is like the kind of computations that exist in something like human intelligence? Yes, the computations are no doubt as powerful. The issue is, can we kind of relate those computations to things that we imagine are human intelligence and the things that we sort of think of as human purposes and so on? Anyway, very interesting stuff. Thank you very much for all of these uh, questions and comments and um, uh, see you again.